yeah, the goal is to keep building it and get stronger and better and smoother at running these events and have great partnerships with brands. And it's fun. It's like, I get to talk to all these people. I know all the the lingo from years in the industry and uh, I I understand the troubles they have and we get to taste a lot of awesome whiskey, which can't complain about that. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. In our career, a lot of us make a pivot. And I had my own where I was really focused on networking in the tech side really early on. After I did my first presentation to a room of 500 people, I discovered I really liked it. And I found a new role in technical marketing. And our guest, he has a similar story, not technically per se, but he really wanted to get into distilling and he made a successful gin brand and then he tried to build a whiskey brand. But he realized how hard it really was and thought, well, instead of me going out there, how can I get more people to try our products here? And that's how Whiskey Riot was born. Bobby Finan, he's the founder and organizer of Whiskey Riot festivals across the country. And we get into his past and getting into the distilling business and how he took on even personal debt to hold his position at his first company, but he ended up launching Whiskey Riot simultaneously. And now Whiskey Riot is expanding to more cities. So if you're looking for a new event to attend, make sure to put Whiskey Riot on your list. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from me. Woo! I have my own idea. I'm not just taking a question. But actually, it kind of came up in conversation recently, and that is, what are my thoughts on distilleries building amphitheaters or music halls or places to bring in, like, legitimate concerts? And I would say I am such a fan of this because I love music. Now, there's not been a better distillery or a better example of someone focusing on music and concerts and creating a venue that is, it feels so separate from the space that many managers and artists aren't even connecting the fact that it's at a distillery. And that's Log Still. Log Still, with what they have done, building an amphitheater out there in the middle of nowhere has been drawing real acts. I'm talking Buck Cherry, Alec King. These are major, major musicians. They've opened for the likes of Guns N' Roses. They've been on major bills like Bourbon and Beyond or Louder Than Life. They've played the Ryman. Well, not Buck Cherry. These are musicians that have played all over the world, and they have huge fan bases, and they've had number one hits. They've had top 10 hits. They hosted... Gary Clark Jr. I think Gary Clark Jr. is amazing. They've hosted Grammy Award winners. You're looking at a place that is building a name for itself in the music industry, which I'm a part of. Like, I'm loosely a part of the music industry. Like, I have a lot of friends in the music business. I co-founded Bourbon and Beyond. I'm always talking to agents and managers. They ask me about things like this. They ask me, like, hey, is this this is log still place? Is it legit? Because we got a lot of artists that are starting to play there. I feel like log still has built an example of what distilleries can do to separate themselves from a tourist perspective. Now, the rub on that is they were there first, and when there's another one that gets built, they're going to be hard to compete against within like 50 miles of that. Now, if you're a brand looking to build a distillery in Indiana, Colorado, places like that, there could be a a pretty strong market there. But I think what Log Still and Wally has done, Wally Dant, the Dant family has done there, they've created something that nobody else was offering. And because that they were there first, they might have just cornered the market for legitimate amphitheater musical experiences in Kentucky. But I'm aware of a couple other distilleries. They've got a couple amphitheaters in mind for music and and hosting comedians and things like that. But I'm all for it. I like the idea of uh, bringing people to distilleries that are not necessarily there just to drink. And so that's kind of my thoughts. I'm all for music going through distilleries. I especially love it when I see A-list acts like Ella King and Buck Cherry show up and do a show at a whiskey distillery. I think that's pretty cool. 
That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. That was just a random conversation I had with friends, and I'm glad I was able to bring it to you. If you would like to hit me up with an idea for Above the Char, go to fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the idea, I'll read it on the air. Till next week. Cheers. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's another brand new episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Just couldn't hear today, but talking to somebody that I've gotten to know over the past, I'd say, year or so, talking through whiskey festivals, brands, and other different things. And he has a very interesting story as we get into this, as we were kind of talking before we started recording. It reminds me of the idea of kind of like how Slack was born. Slack actually started as a gaming company. And they had this internal development tool that they were creating of how they actually communicated with each other. And they realized that the real value of what they were creating was not in the game, but instead it was in the communication tool of Slack. And that's what grew them into a multi-billion dollar company. Now, I'm not going to say that our guest today is, of course, a multi-billionaire, but maybe one of these days we can sit there and Scrooge McDuck it together or anything like that as well. But it's just one of those things where you see you see things and opportunities that happen you make pivots in business and you kind of just figure out, well, what's the best thing that's going to do well for me? And I'm excited to be able to introduce our guest and kind of talk about more about his story, the brands he helped build and the brands he's continuing to help build through his whiskey festivals and everything like that as well. So today on the show, we have Bobby Finan. He is the founder and organizer of the Whiskey Riot Festival. So Bobby, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I would like the idea of Scrooge McDucking into a pile together, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Maybe one day it might have to be something other than whiskey festivals, though. That's the thing. It's like I work in tech. I see the Slack. I see like all these brands that come up and be, they get built and they sell for hundreds of millions or multi billions of dollars. And I'm kind of like, oh man, yeah, that doesn't happen in whiskey and stuff like that. There's pretty decent multiples, but like, 
it's not the tech world. By yeah, I don't have a face like George Clooney either, so I don't think I'm going to get that, that tequila <laughs> premium. I don't think any of us do. Yeah. I think we're both both in the same boat there. Yeah. <laughs> to kick this off and get this going, let's just kind of start about, give people an interesting kind of background about sort of like where you came from, because before you got into doing festivals and anything like that. I mean, like you have your own brand, but even before that, you were really like into just the spirits business. Kind of just give us your background of sort of like how you got to this point right now. And I'll probably end up stopping and asking random questions throughout the way too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the spirits industry, while there's lots of like multi-generational families, there's tons of people who kind of come from really funky backgrounds because spirits are such a, a captivating kind of category and can really enchant people. But so my background's a little bizarre, I guess, how and how I got into the festival space. But I did pretty early on start my career in spirits, even before that, which would have been college. I, I literally, my first job out of college was formerly in the booze business. What were you doing out of college? Uh, immediately, I was the general kind of ad hoc helper, only employee, janitor to distiller at the Cooperstown Distillery. But so if we go even back further than that, I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I ended up going to Hamilton College. It's a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. And I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got there. I majored in economics. And when I got there, this is the logic of a 19-year-old, 18-year-old. I noticed everyone who seemed to have nice cars and, and nice clothes parents were in the finance world around New York City, investment bankers. There really aren't investment bankers in New York City. So at 18, I was like, I don't know what that is, but I want to do that. So I, that speaks to how totally naive and innocent it was. I was an economics major and ended up getting an internship at Citigroup in their consumer products investment banking division. And it was there that I got turned on to all the craft beer acquisitions that were happening at the time. This would have been around 20. 12, 2013, or 2011, 2012. Was this like when Anchor and Cruise, yeah, all that sort of stuff that was going for crazy amounts? Yeah, it was, it was like Anheuser Busch was executing a strategy where they're trying to get like the regional powerhouse brands. So like Goose Island was the Midwest and like got one down in Florida. So I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Cigar City Brewery. Yeah, Cigar City. Yeah. yeah, they've divested a bunch of that stuff, but that was the play then. So in the consumer products group, we were looking at that stuff all the time. I say we, that's a really royal we. I was the intern mostly getting coffee and helping with PowerPoint presentations, but that's what they were looking at. And that kind of turned me on to craft beer. Mind you, in college, Keystone Light was a favorite. So this was more kind of interesting, sophisticated beer. And then the group was, there were a lot of guys in the group who were really interested in whiskey. And at the time, William Grant and Sons had just bought the Hudson whiskey brand, which was just north of New York City. And I think some guys even came into the group were like, oh yeah, me and my wife went up to this distillery. It was a super novel concept at the time. New York had just recently changed its distilling laws and one of them gifted me a bottle of that. And I was like, man, this is so cool. I don't really like sitting in a cubicle all day. I'm not interested or passionate about this work at all. How cool would that be to make whiskey or brew beer or something like that? And my brother, who's older than me, had dropped out of college and started a business, and he's had a lot of success. So it wasn't like the idea of starting a business wasn't so foreign to me, and it was something that was like, you know, maybe I give this a shot. So I kind of went, you know, I was a bad intern. While I was interning, I was just researching how to start a distillery. You got the, <laughs> the creamer and the sugar ratios all wrong. I'd just be Googling how to start a distillery. And at this time, other than guys like hillbilly videos uploading like moonshining stuff before discovery channel had a tv show about it or anything like that it was just guys on youtube in the backwoods like being like this is how you what a condenser is this like there were no forums there was nothing there were no resources at all so you really had to dig through the depths of the internet to figure out how you started distillery you know i remember thinking are there laws around distilleries and stumbling upon the ttb's code of federal regulations with all the rules around distilleries and just literally reading the federal law, just trying to get an idea of how these things operated. And I was really committed to it and told my parents, I'm going to start a distillery. And they were like, that's insane. <laughs> and why don't you go get a job at a distillery first? And I, I found this guy who is the proprietor of uh, the Cooperstown Distillery. They still operate today up in Cooperstown, New York. And he was kind enough to hire me as his just general ad hoc helper. I think he just needed someone to just 
be there on the ground and help. And like, I mean, we did everything from paint the walls to glaze the concrete to get it open. And he gave me a lot of responsibility for a 20 two-year-old that I would never trust a 22-year-old with. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't know if I would either. Yeah, I, I, it's a testament to, I think he just needed someone to to do the work with him. And it was a great learning opportunity. And that was right after college. And I was there for a little less than a, a year or so and was helping on getting back to Buffalo to start a distillery. When you wanted to start the distillery before you went to Cooperstown, did you come to your parents and say, like, I've got a business plan. I, I know what it's going to take. It's like this much capital. It's going to take this. Or were you just like, just winging it? No. Yeah. I was totally winging it. I would love to reconstruct this story. Like I was this like savant. It's amazing how much like charm and charisma can get you when you're young, especially in a time when young people starting businesses was like the Vogue thing instead of being like, oh, maybe we should get an adult to babysit these people because I think Snapchat had just blown up and all these things. So the 20, 22 year old founder wasn't such a, but so I moved back to Buffalo. I got back there. I was like, yeah, I'll just meet people. I'll find a place. I'll raise some capital. How much could it take? $10,000. And I was bartending at like three spots and do, trying to raise capital during the day without really a plan. I put together a plan that in retrospect was totally wrong, but knocking on doors and trying to find people, I ended up running into my business partner, Sean in Sulaco, who was kind of at the tail end of his career. He had been the CMO at a, a Fortune 1000 industrial company, Moog, in Buffalo. And you know, this was a time when in Buffalo, I'd say I want to start a distillery. People would say, oh, I'm I love IPAs and <laughs> people didn't know what they were. And Sean had been out to like high West and had been to distilleries in Europe and was like, oh, will it be like high West? And I was like, yeah, totally. It's going to be just like high West. Spot on. Yeah, spot on. He took a bet on me and was like, you know, I'm looking for a business to run as well. What if I became your business partner? I'll help put some like corporate structure around this. I was 23. I wanted to do my own thing. But in chatting with him, I realized I really didn't know what the hell I was going to doing, that we needed a lot more cash, probably needed to be an adult in the room at the time. But I knew how to make the product. I knew all the regulatory, kind of all the hurdles we had to get through. And Sean kind of helped pull together the capital and was a fantastic business partner. That really made it happen. I think I probably would have been stuck in the dreamer phase for a while if he hadn't taken a bet on me. And what was it like to start? Did you have an idea of the products that you were going to sell, what you were going to distill, what were you going to do, the brand names, like what was it even going to be called? Yeah. So at the time, there were tons of regional brands starting up that were just have like, I'd come from the Cooperstown Distillery, which has a little more cachet because Cooperstown's got the Baseball Hall of Fame and stuff. But a lot of people were naming brands based on the city they were in or the town they were in. And we should build a brand that has a name that has some aspirational elements to it, something that's transferable beyond a region because the reality is I love Buffalo. I consider myself a Buffalo guy, but most of the world doesn't have like the most positive associations with Buffalo, New York. They're not, they think of like with cold winters and four Super Bowl misses, they're not like, gee, I really want to buy a bourbon from Buffalo, New York. So we were looking for something that maybe had a, a nod to the region and spoke to something more aspirational that was kind of in line with our philosophies. And we came across the Tommy Rotter story, which was a group of artists in Buffalo, early 1900s, who were committed to the arts and crafts. They lived in a arts and crafts focused commune out in the woods outside of the city, but would sneak off during the workday, drink a little bit, get into trouble. We're really kind of independent minded individuals. And we liked that idea that it's kind of this equal like work and play mentality. So that's where the name came from. My other Buffalo question for you is how many tables have you jumped through? I have. Because that's a big Bills thing, <laughs> yeah, right? It is. Yeah. I haven't. I've watched a lot of people go through tables and get very injured <laughs> in, at moments when they probably couldn't feel how injured they were. I avoid the table smashing. I do want, like watching it. So yeah, we ended up, the dream was to start a whiskey distillery. We were committed to doing gin and vodka first from just a cash flow standpoint, standard playbook. What time frame is this? This is, by the time we opened the doors, got through all of the red tape, you know, raised capital, got the facility set up. We opened the doors in July, 2015. So I got back to Buffalo in 
early 2014. So it took about a year and a half to raise capital and get through all the state and federal, get stills brought in. And we came out with a gin and vodka with the intent of getting into bourbon. We didn't want to do all the mashing and stuff in house. We were going to have breweries with excess capacity do our mashing for us. And then we do the distilling on site. And the gin just took off. It did really well for us. Tommy Rotter, American Gin, Green Label. I've seen it before. It's around for sure. And upstate New York, it, it, it's really strong. We just never got around to making the bourbon. And by the time it was time to make the bourbon, most of the breweries had gotten mature enough and gotten into distribution. They were like, no, we don't have excess tanks to make your mash for pennies on the dollar, whatever you want it for. So the bourbon got really sidelined for a number of years. And we built the gin business pretty much. We ended up operating in whiskey by 2017 or so in a non-distiller producer capacity. We're sourcing from like MGP and Dickel and doing some blending. And we had our own sales team. We were in like nine or seven states or so across the Northeast. We had a sales team of five. And, you know, we ran into the issues that every distillery does, like sales don't scale as fast, making bets that new products are going to ramp as quickly as the core product you had success with. And the gin kind of just always was the strong player and we couldn't build the bourbon business fast enough. And we ended up in 2019 shedding our sales team and partnering with Palm Bay International. So Palm Bay, family-owned importer, very large supplier, not the mega suppliers like the Diageos and Pernodes of the world, but quite large. They mostly import Italian and French wines and are, are building out their premium spirits book. They have a sales team across the US, strong relationships with Southern Glazer and R&DC and a number of independent distributors in franchise states. And they kind of took us in as a portfolio company. So if you imagine it, it's almost a fourth tier of distribution, formerly called a broker agent relationship. But we sell to them, they sell to the distributor, they, the distributor sells to the retailer, sells to the consumer. And while you're very far back on the value chain in that scenario, we were able to shed the overhead of a sales force and everything, and then be able to leverage some of their political capital within these crowded distributors. So this is all Tommy Rotter. Whiskey Riot's kind of happening during this. i kind of just curious on, on the gin side. Do you know, I mean, you said it took off. Like, do you know what it was about it? Was it the name? Were you doing a ton of marketing? Was it branding? Like, what really was it that took off for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this would be interesting if anyone who's listening is building a brand. So one thing that we did really well, I can't take credit for this. I made a great product. It was my recipe and stuff, but my business partner, Sean, was the CMO of this large Fortune 1000 global company and had managed distribution. I think it was at the time like 200 distributors over 40 countries or something like a massive scale. And he just kind of knew some of the pitfalls to and best practices to employ before we set out. So there wasn't, while there's certainly a spirits learning curve, he just had us approach it much more sophisticated than I would have been able to do it at 23, 24, 25 years old. What we did that really, I think, strengthened the gin's growth was first, we had a lot of capital. We had a strong investor core, so we didn't have to run the business profitable in the early years. That always helps. But then are you spending on the right thing? So what Sean would do from just a distribution management standpoint is we'd enter a relationship with a new distributor, pull down a book of business, and then we would literally sit and be like, okay, what accounts are we going to sell product in this year? How many cases are we going to sell through them? And then we would build out like our playbook and know where we thought we were going to place every single bottle for an entire year and then go out and with the distributor with very clear missions rather than just, hey, go out and sell this product. Just be like, just give me this one account and I need 15 minute meeting with them. And we were just hitting the streets at that time. You know, we were only in upstate New York and in the very early years, we would just make the product in bulk and then no one would be at the distillery. We'd just be out selling it nonstop. So it was kind of like this, come in, make a bunch. Everyone's doing the hand labeling, hand packaging, arts and crafts stuff. And then everyone split and just be knocking on doors all the time. And this is early, mind you, in the craft spirits arc. It's probably wave two. I mean, maybe wave three, if you consider like St. George Spirits 1982 as like the true kind of founders of craft spirits. The next wave comes in with like High West, Whistle Pig, Redemption, 
these non-distiller producers that were kind of sourcing, blending, and getting scale as whiskey got popular in 2009, 10, 11, 12. And then a lot of the states started liberalizing their distillation laws, and there was this next wave. So the distributors were still interested in craft spirits. They saw it as a hot category in the market. Premiumization, quote unquote, was on the rise. So like the gin business had been pretty stagnant, but premium gins were like gins priced 30 bucks and above were growing uh, astronomically compared to the rest of the category. There was a lot of distributor interest to put some numbers around it. The business is not in the same shape it was at its peak now, but like there was a time when Tommy Rotter Gin and kind of the Buffalo Rochester area was outselling Hendrix and Tanqueray at the big stores in the area. Is it just because it was quality? It was local? Was it kind of have some of those things? Yeah, it was quality. It was local. And it was, we would do these things like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not answering your question as, as concisely. Uh, this no, is you're trying good. to dig back in my memory like uh, a number of years back. But the we would do things like a spring push where we would come up with a cocktail and uh, it'd be Tommy Rotter with a Prosecco fizz added to it and lemonade. Something super easy anyone could make. We come up great photography for it, run digital ads saying whatever, it's Tommy, Tommy Rotter lemonade season, gin season's upon us. Run all these ads locally, then have posters in the windows of the store. So as you pull up to the store, you see that cocktail and Tommy Rotter and with the added on Prosecco. And then we go in the store, we'd have an end cap or a display where we've got Tommy Rotter stacked up, pull away cards with the recipe on it. And then we'd get a the retailer who's probably got a white label Prosecco that's a super high margin product, stack that next to it for a drag along sale so that they'd be keen on selling it in the store. They get the two for one sale and one of them's a high margin Prosecco. And then people would go home and you get use cases where people can make the drink. They don't have to buy some special modifier Campari or something that's going to drive up their cost of purchase to like 50, 60 bucks. And we got just a lot of trial and application there. And we spent tons and tons of time in these liquor stores, doing tastings, talking to consumers. It was a success that was really amazing in a concentrated area, but as we would learn down the road, extremely hard to scale over a vast territory. We weren't able to replicate that success elsewhere, but the immense success we had in this tight area was enough to get a lot of distributor attention and a relationship going with Palm Bay International. That's kind of also where we opened the door to Whiskey Riot. You didn't know you were going to sit through a therapy session. Yeah, did you? No. So it was... If I start crying, <laughs> uh, a, yeah, you'll have to reach through the screen with a tissue. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things that as somebody that also owns a brand, it's just always interesting to see exactly like what was success and how was that attributed to different factors and means. And it just sounds like you had somebody that, that really knew distribution, knew the game and what you just mentioned. I mean, that's just a lot of it's blocking and tackling, as they say, just kind of like the nuts and bolts of what it takes to just get products in consumers' hands to create something that's very interesting, appealing to the eye, simple to make, cheap enough, all those different factors like all have to come together to kind of hit this trifecta, if you will. Yeah, totally. That success we had with gin, when it came time to roll out brown spirits, by the time we were doing that, we'd go into a store and people would be like, oh yeah, you guys are the gin company. We're like, oh, well, we also make bourbon too. Or we also make, I think we first came out with an American whiskey because it had some dickel blended into it or something. So it was kind of deflating to walk into places and be like, oh man, are we going to have to do all this work that we just did to get the success we had in gin in brown spirits? Is it really going to be like thousands of hours of liquor stores? It was kind of depressing to think like we're basically going to have to start from scratch. And I'd come up with the idea very naively, like, what if we just do an upstate New York kind of craft distiller whiskey festival? We'll just try and get like a thousand people there and that will have this multiplying effect so we don't have to do as much hard work in the liquor stores. I love the thought process. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, instead of you going out and doing it, you make people come to you. That's where it was. And, you know, we knew everyone in upstate New York because we'd see them out all the time at the events and the liquor store sales calls. And so we just called everyone up, said, Hey, you guys want to come do this? I think it was like 
a hundred bucks for a brand to participate. We were selling tickets for like 30 bucks and it just went totally viral in, in Buffalo because there hadn't been anything like that before. I think we sold like 700 tickets in, it was like six hours, something like that. Back when stuff went Holy really viral locally on Facebook, people weren't as angry on Facebook back then either. Not as many opinions. Yeah, exactly. So after that happened and it sold out rapidly, we started getting calls from the regional sales reps for large nationally distributed brands, Brown Foreman, the Beam Centauri portfolio, which I guess back then was just probably Beam. All of a sudden we had this cool whiskey festival on our hands. It did really well. And I was the youngest person in my kind of investor core at Tommy Rotter. Everyone else was kind of late 50s, 60s, all had a lot of success. And this was kind of like a, a fun investment for them. We had done subsequent capital raises. I had mentioned before we were running the business at a loss in the early years. So that was fueled by capital. So I was at a place where I was the least capitalized individual in the group. So if I can't make a capital call, I had to get diluted. And that was very depressing to me to have gone through all the trials and tribulations of raising capital and trying to grow this business and working my butt off only to have potentially be diluted just from the realities of it being a capital intensive business. And I had taken out, this is probably the most cowboy thing I've ever done, maybe just insane instead of cowboy, but I had taken out private debt to make my capital calls. Oh, wow. Were you married at the time? Or no, no, I wasn't. Yeah, okay, there you go. All right. So, because that probably would have been a different conversation. Yeah. So, interest rates were low at the time. So, I mean, now the interest rate's modest for what the debt was, but it was high interest at the time. And I was going to service that with the cash flows from Whiskey Riot. What time frame is this, by the way? What year? I knew the capital call was, it was going to be coming in the spring of 2018. So Whiskey Riot happened, the planning of it started in 2017 because we had just rolled out the Brown Spirits then. The first Whiskey Riot event was in 2018, uh, in January. So I knew a capital call was coming. There was going to be a scenario where like, oh, maybe Whiskey Riot makes enough money that we don't need to do a capital call, which again, these are the thoughts of someone who really didn't understand business at the time. I was just making this stuff and selling it. I really didn't have a great handle on the business. I was 26 or so. The event was successful. It made some money. And I started being like, oh, maybe I just run this on the side. Then I can take on some personal debt so I don't get diluted at Tommy Rotter. And I will service that debt with the cash flows of Whiskey Riot. Really insane stuff. Yeah, I was about to say, because was the original intent to say that, well, maybe Whiskey Riot can help basically fund everything that's happening at Tommy Rotter so you wouldn't have to get diluted? Was that the main thought process at first? That was like kind of one of the early thoughts. And we never had a hospitality business at Tommy Rotter where most of the our regional competitors had like a pub or a bar and they'd get the high margin cocktail sales because they were supplying the, the booze themselves and selling $10, $12 cocktails. And that was kind of their capital source to cash flow the business. So they didn't have to rely on investor capital as much. We were only a wholesale operation. We never had that hospitality component. And Whiskey Riot, early on, we were like, all right, we can kill two birds with one stone. We'll have the awareness factor. And then this is almost like our hospitality entertainment. It's basically or like running a, a wedding venue or something, except instead of a wedding every weekend, it's just one big whiskey festival. I had done all the work on it. And I just said to my investors, I was like, I guys, I'm just going to take this and run it as a side thing. And then I can also contribute to the capital calls. And I didn't tell them at all that I was taking private debt to hold my position. That really kind of put a fire under me to be like, all right, let's turn Whiskey Riot into its own core business. And now Whiskey Riot starts to grow parallel to Tommy Rotter, but separate businesses. So this is 2018. We have success with the first Whiskey Riot. And now it starts being like, okay, can we put this into multiple markets? Can you scale this up? Can this be a real cash center for me so that I can hold my Tommy Rotter equity? I guess when it comes to throwing the whiskey festivals, it's not as capital intensive as it was to build Tommy Rotter because you're not putting people into every single liquor store and doing tastings, but instead you're relying on some virality, some Facebook marketing, some event bright marketing and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of the origin story of Whiskey Riot. Whiskey Riot today is much more sophisticated and it's much more capital intensive. There's more overhead. 
I'd love to get into that a little bit to wrap up the kind of. Oh, we will. Don't you worry about it. The the Tommy Rotter side kind of, I can wrap that story pretty quickly. So we continued on in 2019 with Palm Bay International, as I had mentioned before, we used their sales organization. COVID happened right after we partnered with them. And it just kind of took the wind out of the sales. Our business in the on-premise world totally decayed, but we were sustained with the off-premise growth during the pandemic years. Palm Bay was kind of looking for a partnership where a distributor would get behind the product. The market, since we had begun in 2015, had changed a lot. There's a lot of saturation in craft spirits. You know, There were a lot of strong regional players in gin that would make it difficult to pierce markets. And a number of the large brand holding companies, publicly traded firms, had entered the premium gin space with like the monkey 47s of the world, Beam Centauri's acquisition of Sip Smith. Everyone got their product to fill that spot in the portfolio where there was some growth. So it was going to be harder to acquire customers and hold territory. Palm Bay was really looking for a meaningful commitment from a distributor. And Southern Glazer came around and they had an initiative coming out of Miami, which was they were going to get behind kind of like regional powerhouses in certain products. And Tommy Rotter had a lot of strength in the New York market upstate, which people think were kind of like hillbillies up north of New York City, but the entire upstate market is big as Metro New York. It's one half of the state. It's just spread out over a vast territory. Tommy Rotter was going to be the champions up there. However, Palm Bay had a rock star gin product, and they still do. Gunpowder gin took off like a rocket ship. Palm Bay and Southern, well, what if Tommy Rotter rolls out this core bourbon and we're going to really get behind it. We're going to sell big numbers of cases. We're going to push them nationally. They're going to be craft focus of Southern. And the launch was kind of bobbled with still COVID lag, a lot of like no in-person general sales meetings to kick off. And it just, it didn't land. And the product the our bourbon went out into a lot of different places and didn't get the turn. The bourbon market had gotten extremely saturated. We didn't have the same success that we did with our gin product. Fortunately, the gin business is still pretty healthy, but just recently we shut down our bourbon manufacturing and we actually are in the process of divesting the gin business. So that's where we are today. It's February 19th of 2024 as we record this, but there's an entire story of the growth of Whiskey Riot that happened parallel to this and now Whiskey Riot's my main bag. That's the meat of this subject here. So, I mean, at this point, you started Whiskey Riot. You had that first festival. You had some initial success. What's the next phase besides taking on more private debt? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. And go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today, shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S.com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription.
I made it out alive on that, by the way. I should know it. So, so no one needs to <laughs> send me a, a GoFundMe account for Bobby Finan. So rewind, we have the first successful event in Whiskey Riot. And immediately, just because I hadn't been all around the country yet, that partnership with Southern through Tommy Rotter took me to tons and tons of states. I feel like I just saw so much of the country and saw so much opportunity during that phase. In 2018, it was very much Northeast oriented. And we were like, there's all these underserviced cities in upstate New York, like Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, second cities in Providence, Rhode Island, or Hartford, Connecticut that are in the shadow of Boston, what if we service these markets rather than going head-to-head with large whiskey fests, the shanking communications of the world that have whiskey fest? By the way, it was originally called Buffalo Whiskey Fest, and we got a cease and desist. So that's where the Whiskey Riot name was born. It's kind of a good thing, right? I mean, you needed something that was a little bit more, yeah, a little more even-keeled and spreads a lot more to different regions. Absolutely. So we set out in 2018 to go launch the event in Rochester, Albany, these kind of small markets. And we just didn't know what we were doing. And I say we, that was me and my sister was helping out at the time. The first event was successful because from like a, a viral phenomenon. And that did not happen anywhere. And we were spending, we didn't know anything about marketing that much. We were spending on radio ads and billboards and stuff. Facebook's ads were solid, but you kind of had to be a little techie to understand how to run them. And we lost a ton of money. So all the money that was made in Buffalo, that cash flowed the growth for these next cities and the next two cities lost money. And from there, I was like, all right, I got to really figure this out, focus in, and I'm just going to run it in Buffalo. So we ran it, built it up in Buffalo. I was operating the business. I would get third-party kind of event management firms to help me with the day of, but it was really dialing in and understanding how it makes money, where the risk is, what's the break-even point, all these really basic things. And it was a great business education because it's a, it's not a super complicated business. And Tommy Rotter, I just wasn't exposed that much to that side of the business. It taught me a bunch of things about business that allowed me to understand the manufacturing, distribution, and sales business that is the liquor industry. And we just ran it in Buffalo for a number of years. And it was really the pandemic that shut down New York State for an extended period of time that pushed the business down into Dallas. And the things that kind of shifted over time was I had much more experience in the spirits industry. I knew the challenges that the brands face. Uh, I knew how to market the event. I learned how to market the event a lot more. And then finally, I ended up going to business school while running Whiskey Riot and Tommy Rotter, which was nuts. And my wife basically spoon fed me and washed my underwear for me to keep me alive because there was just no free second in the day. And that blew my mind wide open to understanding the need in the market for something like Whiskey Riot, which I'll get into, how the liquor industry had totally shifted during my time in the industry and what value we could add to both attendees and brands. And it's really the brands that it's most important to add this value to because without them, there's no Whiskey Riot. What you see the financial of this? It's like, what do you put into it? And just to ballpark it, it's like, if somebody says like, oh, I got this great idea, like I'll go create my own whiskey festival. It's like, what's your return on investment on this? I'm just genuinely curious. Yeah. So, you know, it obviously fluctuates based on attendance and stuff like that and how hard the cost of acquisition of a customer is in a new market. Mature markets are easier. We just did our seventh year in Buffalo. It's much easier to market those tickets because we've got a mailing list of like 7,000 people in Buffalo, whereas going in cold to a new market, it's totally different economics. But For someone who says, yeah, I want to get in and do this, there aren't so much, you can do it cheaply. You might not get a bunch of people to show up. And then the brands will be like, that was a waste of my time. Thanks for ruining one of my free weekends. And I'm never going to show up to one of your events again. So you can do it poorly. When we go into a market and we have overhead now, uh, there's full-time employees because it's the brand relationship management itself is a full-time job to do it nationally. The cost of an event is like $70,000 to put on a whiskey ride. And that always blows people's mind. We could skimp on that. There's a million places to cut costs. You know, you can have less security. You can have less insurance. You can have all the things that can make the event dangerous and chaotic and a bad experience. We get a bunch of staff so that the brands 
aren't panicked that there's always fresh water at their table, that they have fresh ice, there's dump buckets that are being emptied on time. I can't tell you how many events I've been to for whiskey or for Tommy Rotter where they're just like, it's great. Someone had an idea and they got a bunch of people to show up and it's just mayhem. I'm sure you've been to some of those as well. Here's a six foot table. We'll see you later. Yeah, absolutely. And you're on your own. And then there's like a, a horde of drunk people that are behaving badly and you're basically chop liver. So everything we do is to try and make it a positive experience for the brands and to make sure that they have people who want to actually learn about their products, not just get cheap liquor or samples and get drunk. It's not tech or anything super cerebral, but we've put some sophistication around our management platform that makes it so it's a tightly run event and high ROI for attending brands. And a big part of that cost, as we were talking about, is advertising. We charge $90 a ticket. It's not cheap to come into one of our events, but we go into a new market and we advertise a ton. A lot of that's through the meta platforms, Instagram and Facebook, which has a skew to older demographics. So we don't get the Gen Z kids. We, don't, we get people who have disposable income and are mature enough that they and old enough that they could go to a liquor store and spend several hundred dollars in one fell swoop. Those are the people that are curious about new products. Our messaging is all rooted around trial and education. So we tend to not get the hardcore zealots that know the middle name of the master distiller of Stitzel Weller from 19 whatever. It's people who have a few bourbons that they like. Maybe they listen to a podcast or two because they're curious and really see value in the opportunity of trying products side by side and understanding the nuance and learning maybe some tidbits about the brand story, the manufacturing process that enriches their relationship with the brand. Acquiring those customers is quite expensive. And like a new market, it can cost $25 in advertising alone to sell a ticket. What does it look like for you to sit there and because right now, like Whiskey Riot, you're expanding, right? Like you're going into more cities, more different places. For you, what's it look like to evaluate a city to say, hey, this is a place where we could do something at? Yeah. So we go into a, a market and there's always some friction when it's a new place. The local regulators might not be used to someone operating like the way we do, or the distributors don't understand how we're operating. But so we look at the regulatory environment, number one. So it, that clears a bunch of th- states off the board, like control states. There's just no way to operate the events like we do. And then we look at population, demographic. Part of it is like, are there enough people who are 30 and up in the city with disposable income? We don't want to be like in Brooklyn and have selling tickets on Groupon for, I mean, Brooklyn's matured, I guess, from where it was when Brooklyn blew up. But we don't want 22-year-olds walking in thinking it's a party. The name Whiskey Riot sounds fun. That's for marketing cachet, but it's supposed to be educational. No one's supposed to be behaving poorly. (laughs) Everyone's supposed to be respectful of these brands that are dedicating their time to get their message out. We're looking for our older middle class, upper middle class demographic. I know that all our ambassadors that have been to the Whiskey Riot Festival, because of course, Pursuit Spirits has been at a few of them last year and will be at more of them this year. And they've always had a good time. They always say that it's quality people that come. You're getting, I wouldn't say good leads, but you're getting curious, and interested people that are there to, that really want to try a lot of new stuff. And I guess that's the thing is, is how have you pitched this to other brands? Because for us, I look at it as a, probably the best opportunity for us to get in front of new people as a small brand. That's the best way to do it versus somebody like when I go to places and I'll see there'll be a booth that where Maker's Mark is there. And I'm like, doesn't everybody already know Maker's Mark? Like what, what else is, I don't understand why they're here. Like why do they waste their marketing budget? Kind of give me your thought process on a legacy brand versus somebody that's new and upcoming. Yeah, absolutely. So the legacy brands want to be out there. They have the budget, but it's more to hold market share. They're not present. They will fade. And a lot of them are pushing out products that are kind of more premium, single barrel releases or small batch releases, whatever, special wood finishes that they're trying to get out. So they put those out there just to launch new products and they use this as a vector for a launch. So like, for example... William Grant and Sons owns Tullamardu. Tullamardu is coming out with a, a flavored profile. Like that's a perfect opportunity where they'd allocate money to Whiskey Rye because they want to just get trial in a large format. Others are much more just looking to hold territory. For new brands, the messaging is all about building relationships direct with the consumer. And I'm going to get into that. But before I do, just I, w- I want to make one note. I think w- one thing that we really stress when we're talking to brands is like, 
I've been 10 years a small business owner in the liquor industry. I've spent, I can't tell you how many hours at events. And for a long time during Tommy Rotter, my wife and I, my now wife, were doing a long distance relationship. She was living in Manhattan and I'd go back and forth between Buffalo and New York. And the weekends where I would commit to an event where I would forfeit going to spend time with my future wife because someone told me there's going to be a thousand people here and I get there and there's 200 people there and it's chaotic. I can't tell you the rage I would feel. And so I feel so violated and the organizers would be like, oh, well, next year we're hoping for this. I mean, next year, you basically lied to me. You had me pay a price based on a value proposition you didn't back up. At the end of the day, no one had any bad intentions, but you did waste time and money for people who are forfeiting their free time and trying to grow their business. And I would take that very personally. So everything we do at Whiskey Riot is like, yeah, we probably spend too much on advertising in a new market. We just went into Tampa and we sold out. We don't do the discounting nonsense, fire sailing stuff just to fill it up because you're going to get attendees who don't value what they paid for and are going to behave poorly and they're not going to be of value to the attendees. So that's something I feel really passionate about. And I think I get that across in the product that we deliver and in our sales pitch to brands because everyone's done that. Everyone feels that if you sell liquor, that you've been kind of used for entertainment and someone didn't deliver on that. And it's a crappy feeling. On the other end of that, the sales pitch is like, look, the distribution industry has changed over the last 15 years. And I'm going to get into that a lot. I think it's kind of interesting for listeners because it's something you don't really see. As a general consumer, you go to a liquor store, your point of contact for buying products is the liquor store salesperson maybe you got a relationship with. And maybe you know the regional Beam Centauri guy who hooks you up with some swag every once in a while. That's it. Behind the scenes is this complex industry, the distribution tier of the three-tier system, and that's changed drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. For brands, it's increasingly difficult to get distributor share of mine because there's been a lot of consolidation and most states operate with basically a duopoly or triopoly system. And historically, distributors were sales and marketing organizations that kind of took care of the logistics, the warehousing and the delivering of goods. But it's important to note that the sales back, I don't know if you want to call it the golden era of distribution, whatever. The glory days, if you will. The glory days that you hear these stories of. The sales were much more outbound oriented. The sales guys were knocking on doors, trying to grow partner portfolio brands. You had to be or else another distributor would come in and kind of eat your lunch. And throughout the business cycles over the last 30 to 40 years or so, lots of family-owned regional distributors, either the owners got old and retired and didn't have an heir to give it to, to continue on the family legacy, or experienced some financial hardship and we're looking to transfer, divest their ownership. A lot of distributors became available for purchase. And shrewd operators kind of saw that the true cost center of a distribution business is the logistics component. Guys, it would be no surprise who've really mastered this are Southern Glazer, RDC, Breakthrough. I mean, these are sophisticated businesses run by very smart people, very able people who know their businesses inside and out. Everyone thinks the distributors of like the 1980s style, some guy, the fast talking sales guy shooting finger pistols at people. These are well-educated MBAs that are running behemoth businesses and are very sophisticated. And the core cost center of the business is the logistics component, not the sales and marketing, the trucks, the warehouses, the regular route running. And you can't not like really toggle those costs in a tough market environment where you can cut down your furlough sales people, dial back marketing spends. So the efficient management of the fixed costs, all that overhead I just talked about is really the salvation for a distributor. And the best way to do that is just filling up those trucks as much as possible and getting economies of scale and make sure that every truck that goes to a store when it leaves the warehouse every day is 100% full. And you do that by basically getting big suppliers who have brand products that are American household names. And it allows your sales effort to be much more inbound oriented. You can have younger, less sophisticated or less skilled salespeople that are servicing the accounts. And you become less of a brand builder as a distributor than an order taker and kind of push the outbound sales component and the outbound marketing component back onto the brands. I'm sure you experience this with your brand And you basically just focus on fulfilling your core functions, which are of great value. Don't get me wrong. Delivering goods from A to B, 
the safe collection of state excise tax for states in which you hold a license, which the states value very much and will protect that. And finally, and I think this gets discounted quite a bit, but it's an extremely important service that distributors offer is credit risk protection for suppliers. And this is often discounted, but think about it. 50% of hospitality businesses in the US operate their financials on the back of a cocktail napkin. If you are distributing in five states or so, collecting your account receivable from these frenetic restaurant owners that you know are moving a million miles a minute and are overworked, it's a tough order for a small business to do. So distributors provide that. But What has become very clear is it's incumbent upon brands now to build a direct relationship with their consumers and more than it ever was before. And you do that through liquid ellipse and intimate conversations with consumers who that will evangelize your product to their friends and their network. That's it. And Whiskey Riot provides that service. I think we do it in a meaningful way at a low cost per impression in a safe environment, an environment that's fair and respectful to brands. And that's my hard sales pitch, I guess. You wrapped up a lot there. We've definitely shifted in the way that when we first started getting into this and distributors always tell you like, oh, we're a brand builder. We'll do this for you. And talk is cheap. That's kind of what it comes down to because we kind of mentioned at the very beginning of the show uh, before it recorded that I, I don't blame them. Like Distributors want to sell what's easy. They don't want to sell what's hard. And they're there to sit there and retake orders and go and look at the short store shelves. And if there's a few bottles missing, they'll go to their iPad and check the one box or whatnot. But they're not really in a position to sit there and be a hardcore salesperson when they have, I mean, that's the problem with a lot of distributors. They have this huge portfolio, every single one. They all have huge portfolios. And so you're continually trying to battle for mindshare there. So a lot of us, yeah, we've had to kind of shift and you've got to get into the mind of the consumer and going direct to them. The hard part that really sucks is that at the end of the day, even though we go to Whiskey Ride, we have all these great interactions with folks and they're like, hey, where can I get your bottles? And it's like, well, our distributor is only good enough to get them in like five stores in this region. And it's like, ugh, right? It still comes around to like them still being the people that have the stronghold on this, but you still have to build that somehow. You got to just catch some wave at the consumer level where everybody's asking for it and then stores will ask for it and then it'll get the distributor's attention. And so it kind of has to build this kind of like groundswell movement, if you will. Yeah. The brands that do that really well, I mean, the ones that go kind of unicorn status have some je ne sais quoi. I'm sure there's a million things happening behind the scenes that they might not even be able to articulate why they did it so well. But these kind of phenomenon brands, there's this network effect that happens and you can see it online in the online bourbon communities the bottle shares, all this stuff, that is the network effect in action and getting invited into that hallowed club is hard to do. But for everyone else, it's the blocking and tackling of consumer outreach, building it block by block. Because if you're waiting around to have some viral product that you might be waiting. You can make it forever. Yeah. Yeah. You might be waiting forever or you might just go bankrupt while you do. Tommy Rotter wasn't built on virality, right? It was a lot of just grassroots and marketing and stuff like that too. So I get it. Absolutely. The goal then with Whiskey Ride is to get it up to, you know, I don't think it'll ever be something that's in every city in America. Brands don't have the budget for it. I think some cities can handle a Whiskey Riot once a year. Some probably need it pulsed every other year. In a perfect world, it'd be operating in like 20 cities or so, maybe 17 or so, and then some come every other year or so. And we are working on launching... I know it's not relevant to this podcast, but uh, tequila and agave focused vertical of the event. And I think that event management and adding real value to sponsors where they are the main attraction is this unique space sponsoring events. A lot of events use it just basically as an add-on revenue source. So we've kind of got this funky event space where the entertainment, if you will, it makes us have to be forced to have a much more respectful relationship with them because the brands do have power. If they don't want to show up, if we don't give them what they need, the whole thing's dead. But yeah, the goal is to keep building it and get stronger and better and smoother at running these events and have great partnerships with brands. And it's fun. It's like, I get to talk to all these people. I know all the the lingo from years in the industry. I understand the troubles they have and we get to taste a lot of awesome whiskey, which can't complain about that. That's the upside. Absolutely. 
Well, cool, man. So I guess if people want to know more about Whiskey Riot, how can they get tickets? The festivals, are they in my city? How do they go and do that? Yeah, so we have it all on our website, our ticketing partners, Tixer. So if you go to our website, www.whiskeyriot.com, it's got the calendar for the year. Normally, we're pushing out like a year's calendar in October the previous year. So 2024 is all listed out. There won't be any new surprises popping up as additional cities in 2024. We'll, by June or so, start working on our 2025 calendar to push that out later this October. But Join our mailing list. We break it out by regions. You say what you're interested in, so you're not getting spammed by us constantly. If you live in San Antonio and we're promoting the Boston event, you won't get that traffic. We just basically hit up folks when we're coming to town say about six weeks out or so and start saying, hey, we're going to be in town. Hope to see you. Here's the ticketing link. Very simple stuff. Very cool, man. Like I said, this has been a fun conversation. I just love how you had a very interesting entrant into the market of spirits just because you wanted to start doing the distillation side. You did the brand building side and you've taken that brand building expertise and really put it towards something that is going to hit a ton of people. And it's not just you're delivering a good experience to the end consumer, but you're also helping brands find those consumers that they necessarily wouldn't have before. This is just one of those things that I know that our ambassadors that have done whiskey rides, especially in the Texas market, stuff like that, they've all come back and said what a fantastic job it was and how much fun they had. And I'm excited to just kind of see the growth of this new states, new cities and everything like that of, of where whiskey rides going to go. Yeah. Thanks so much. And thanks for hosting me. We're also happy to have you guys participate where you can. And if any brands are listening or, or sales reps for brands, just reach out on our website. we got a direct quote unquote sponsor portal. You can just ping us and we'll send you all the information. We love building relationships. There's a number of companies that we've talked to for three years or so. And then they're finally at a, a place where they're like, oh, you know, Boston's really going to be a focus for us in 2025 or 2024. We'll be there. These are long-term relationships we have. And please don't be shy about starting that now. Very awesome. Well, Bobby, thank you again for coming on the show today. And if you're out there and you're interested about this, we always say that whiskey festivals in general is a, just a good place to go to not only just congregate around like-minded people, but you know you get an opportunity to try all kinds of stuff that you never would have before. So make sure you check out and see if a whiskey riot festival will be in your neck of the woods soon. Also follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review. Don't leave us a review. That's fine. At least share it with a friend and buy your friend also a ticket to Whiskey Riot Festival. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next time.